Daffodils are blooming, my roses are leafing out, garden catalogs are pouring in. It's time to start thinking about new rose introductions for 2022. wonderful new roses coming out for 2022 and I'm excited to talk to four people about roses coming from their respective nurseries and companies. I think you're really going to enjoy it. The timestamp is up next to me so you can roll ahead and see where you want to get to. We're going to start with Ping Lim, which is probably, probably in my opinion, the best unknown rose breeder we've got out there. You really want to check out his True Bloom series. We'll talk to Wes Harville at Jackson Perkins about some roses exclusively found only at Jackson and Perkins. Heidi Mortensen, Star Roses and Plants, wonderful rose plant nursery, introducing wonderful roses from not only Mayand and Cordes, but people like Jim Sproul, and just a really nice collection of roses. I'm going to wrap it up with my friend Rebecca Coradum from David Austin Roses and talk about all the new David Austin Roses and even a few from last year. So let's get started and go meet Pink. It is always good to see you. Welcome to the Everyday Rose Show, and thanks for joining me. Thank you, Paul. That's my honor to be invited, interviewed by you, Paul. Thank well, you. Well, it's my honor to interview you, so the feeling is mutual, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I, but before we start talking about your roses, I want people to know a little bit more about you. Um, you know, I've known you for a while. I've known your roses, certainly, for a long time. So you started rose breeding in 1981. You've bred roses like Love and Peace, Daydream, Rainbow, Sor Rainbow Sorbet, and the Easy Elegance line. You're a longtime rose breeder. So at the end of the day, would you tell the viewers what is Ping Lim looking for in the roses that he breeds? Yeah, first of all, when I start rose breeding uh, since 1981, start with the greenhouse cut flower and pot roses. And then I run into uh, Dr. Lambert, Peter Lambert, uh, Walter Lambert, yeah, who created the, the Queen Elizabeth, the Grand Defora. And then at that time, he retired. I asked him, uh, what are you going to do after you retire? And he said, I'm going to breed something, no need to using chemical disease, resistant roses. That is 1983. That's way ahead of its time. Yes. And then uh, after I left, uh, I left uh, a divorce nursery for the cut flower breeding, and then I worked for the commercial company called Mount Eden. And then after that, I think the future of the rose, right now we have so many roses out there in the market, you name it. What is the future of the rose that we are going to, uh, to pursue? And then I, I started working at Bailey Nursery in Oregon, and then we start a program, brand new program, the program without using any chemicals. So then I feel that is the future of our roses. No need to using any chemicals. So the rose and grow can beautify your garden without poison your environment. That is the essential of my rose breeding program to create the rose, not only disease resistant and also have to be hardy that zone four, zone five people can enjoy the rose that repeat blooming year round. So we start that easy, arrogant lie since 19, uh, 1991. So after that, we start improving our roses year by year. So when people ask me what, uh, what my kind of rose will be look like, I, would, I can tell you the rose supposed to be look like rose. So we have high center, fragrance, hardy, disease resistant, and bigger flower. <laughs> and keep on blooming and mass of bloom. How about that? So yeah, there, you is just... a lot of, there is a lot of combination that to make this uh, rose difficulty uh, to create. So day by day, year by year, we're still searching for a perfect rose. So when people ask me, what's your perfect rose? I said, the perfect rose should, should 
contain a lot of chi, internal energy inside the plant that can be repeat faster, that can bloom a lot, that can have fragrance. That's what I thought about roses. Maybe my dream is too big. <laughs> No, I don't think it's too big at all. And, and and I will say, I mean, you know, you've having watched your work over the years, you know, you're you're keep getting closer and closer to what you call that perfect rose. I mean, you know, so you could almost say when someone says, what's the perfect rose? You can say, well, the next one I breed per, could very well be that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but even the roses you have read to now and, you know, disease resistance, fragrance, that's such an important characteristic that because, you know, what do we all do when we first see a rose? We stick our nose in it. That's the first thing that we do. Um, and, and so you've achieved that. And that, that brings us to the True Bloom series, which is the series that you're breeding now. So give us, so this is a group of roses. They're different colors in this thing, but I know they have characteristics in common. So what is the characteristics in common of the True Bloom series? Yeah, uh, actually we trademark uh, a name called hybrid tea shrub, the rose. That means the rose grow like shrub but bloom like hybrid tea. That's a nice so, combination, yeah. So that means the row have to be very vigor and strong growing, but all come out with the hybrid tea rows. So the true bloom, the true bloom, the name actually tell the story, is true to roses. Have to be high center, multiple petal, fragrance, and repeat blooming, those things. So true bloom row is in this kind of, uh, thinking to create this uh, true bloom rose different than other kinds of roses. Yeah, and that's a nice combination because you have people with shrub roses that, you know, everybody, there's lots of different kinds of styles of flowers and roses. And that's one of the joys of roses is that there's a really a rose for everybody, literally. Um, but a lot of people say they love the shrubs because of the full foliage and the vigor and the, the characteristics you just mentioned, but they really love that classic high pointed centered hybrid tea type type bloom. And basically the name that you coined, hybrid tea shrub rose, you, you're basically marrying the two with this series, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We trim out that. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I think it's the name. Yeah. We like yeah. the name. So. Oh, I think it's great. So, so, and the other thing I saw too, there's two things I like about it that I'd like you to talk about. One, their own root, which I'm all about. Yeah. Um, and also these tend to be more compact is what you're saying. So, I mean, what's like an average height for some of these? Yeah. Uh, you know, look at the today environment that we have. The growing area is smaller, living area is smaller. So you need to have the plant compact, tight and low grow. Obviously we, the idea I would say three by three, you know, three, three high, three, uh, th three wide. And then some is go up to four and five, unless you are the climber. And um, most of my role I create, I just looking for the compactness. You know, I have the new winner called uh, True Love. The, 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 the other name is called Red Captain. It's only one and a half or two by two. That's it. And with multiple bloom. So that is the idea of, uh, I think the rows have to be compact and low grow. And that's a great combination because a lot of people, like you said, gardens are getting smaller. So people don't have the room that they used to have. Yeah. And the other thing is that a lot of people are starting to grow roses in containers on a deck or a patio or something like that. And it sounds like this series would be really good for that as well. Am I right? Yes. Uh, because when we, uh, when we marketing the roses, if you can have the flower in the plant on the container itself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with button bloom, they call that. Nothing makes yeah, a rose button, fly out the door when it's yeah. got flowers on it. That's for sure. Yeah. So take us through. So, you know, you, you, you sent me some information on, on five of the series. Talk about maybe some of the individual ones, the colors, and just, you know, what are some of your favorites, for example, in the True Bloom series? Talk about some of the individual varieties. Yeah. The first one I want to recommend is called True Passion. It's the one we get the first winner from Bill Moore called Double Ten. I don't know. I remember it remember. very well. Yeah, that, that actually is so honored that when we received the award in second year, you guys call to send it 50 or 100 plants. Yeah. You want to put in the garden site. And, and, there's, fact, and I would say that they're still in the Biltmore Garden. It's one of the yes. most, uh, but it's, yeah, it, it's always in bloom. It's a terrific rose. It fills the bed. It does everything that your vision wanted it to do. Yeah, and, and interesting is after the people visit that prey, they call. Where can I get this rose? I got a lot of email and calls to ask for double 10. Actually, the, the commercial name is right now we call True Passion. 
Yeah, so that is the one is a highlight. The, the reason is good about not only in the southern part, like in Florida or in Massachusetts, they all perform beautifully. Uh, we first about uh, was 2015, we noticed this true passion will be performing from Florida. Go to Florida test for two years with that Florida high humidity and heat and all kind of problem, but that true passion is bloom like crazy. <laughs> yeah, Florida's a hard climate. That's a yes. really, really tough yeah. climate as well. And then we get the call from Massachusetts as well. They said, this road is good. We want to sell it. So that become the winner. Yeah. And yeah, after that, we got, the, we got the winner from ARTS, American Rose for, Try for Substantial, the Master yeah. Rose Award as well. So two award significant. So yeah. how many, how many, how, how, how many more you want me to talk about my rose? Yeah, I mean, talk about, well, there's another one too that, that really catches my eye, True Friendship, which I understand was a, a Rose Hill award, uh, award winner in 2016. Um, tell us about that. It's a nice, nice clear yellow is what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, that is a three by three, actually the size yeah. of the rose, uh, even in California, three by three. And it's fragrant, disease resistant, and easy to propagate. How about that? Normally, yellow rose is very hard to own root. It's not yeah. root that easy. We have to bud a lot of yellow rose, but this uh, true friendship is the one that we can own root easily. Yeah, and great fragrance and disease resistance in the yellow rose is also nice to come by. Sometimes yeah. sometimes yellow roses can be kind of on that margin a little yeah. bit, but again- And the know. other similar to it is called true sincerity. It's a, a multiple color a very eye-catching color and without disease. And that variety will be, will be, in, will be highlight in all the garden in the future. I, I think they're all gonna be highlights. And actually, so, so where can people buy, buy the True, true, uh, true uh, Bloom series? Where can they purchase them? Yeah, right, right now we work with uh, Home Depot and Lowe, the okay. back store, both store. And then we also work with the Synergy Group is a, a garden center uh, group that they have about five to six grower in the East Coast. So they have a garden center buying their plants. So they were including True Bloom into uh, their garden center group as well. Super, Synergy. so basically they're pretty, they're widely available and things like that. Yes. And yes. so people want to know more about you. You have your own website, which is rosesbypingling.com. Yes. Yeah, so we'll put that on the screen as well. And if they want to learn more about the True Blue series, Bloom series, where on the internet would they find those? Right now, True Bloom have a truebloomrose.com as well. We are going to up, update it uh, pretty soon. So we're going to uh, make something more excitement on the True Bloom website. So wonderful. So truebloom.com, roses by Ping Lim is where you can learn more about Ping. And we're actually going to do, Ping and I are going to do a show on just Ping by himself in the future. His background, folks, is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> but for right now, I can tell you right now, you're going to want his roses in your garden. So Ping, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to putting some of the True Blooms in my garden, and we will talk again. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We'll talk to you again. Wes, welcome to the Everyday Rose Show. It is great to have you on the show and great to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. You, you, you got a hold of me here at my favorite time of year. I know it should be spring, but I love fall. And I love fall because of fall color. And I love it because it's not hot anymore. Yeah, you're in Greenwood, South Carolina, which can get uh, nasty hot, needless to say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that part of the world. So talk to me a little about Jackson Perkins. Most of us who've been growing roses for a while remember Jackson Perkins from the Garden Center days back 10, 15 years ago. The company's changed. It's been around a long time. Give us the, you know, real quick skinny on where JP is today. Well, to say the company's changed is, is one thing, but the world has changed. The world of plants has changed. And Jackson Perkins now is an online retailer of plant material and plant-related gifts. And we even have a big holiday growing collection. Yes, yeah, so you've got a lot going on there too. So it's, you know, so you're now completely online, jacksonperkins.com. That's where folks can find you. You also have something kind of unique too as well, because you know, most people associate buying roses in the spring, but at jacksonperkins.com, they can buy them in the spring and the fall, correct? 
Yes, we have a really broad selection of container roses in the fall. We sell a mixture of Jackson Perkins varieties and varieties from all over the world in a two quart program that ships from September through early November, depending on your climatic zone. Yeah, and that's great I, because there are a lot of folks where fall planting is actually a really good idea, myself included, in Zone 7 upstate of South Carolina. And the other thing, too, is Jackson Perkins, of course, has that long history of breeding roses that are unique to Jackson Perkins. And you offer, again, through your website, roses that really only you guys have. Yes, at this point, we have over 250 varieties that we sell from, depending on the season in our collection, uh, and over 100 of those are unique to Jackson and Perkins. Yeah, and that's a, so it's a great place to get some roses that you're not going to find anywhere else. And like you mentioned earlier, you also offer perennials and fertilizers and all kinds of great stuff. So let's dive into some of the new varieties that you're offering for this coming uh, uh, this coming year. There Again, they'll be on your website. Folks can find them there. So let's start with Icaramba. Tell me about it. Icaramba, to me, is perfectly named. Uh, Icaramba is bright orange. It's a floribunda. And I think what stands out with that variety is that when you drive along the, the field and you're looking out the window and you're uh, seeing the whole crop in general, imagine seeing hundreds of varieties, thousands per variety. Icarumba's orange, bright orange shines out. If you uh, get up close, it's even got a really soft reverse. That's why we love this. Yeah, it's a beautiful rose looking at the photograph. And I can see this going really nicely, like if you paired it with like some of the blue salvias or lavenders or things like that. I think you got a great combination growing here. And, and as you mentioned in the field mass planted, you know, imagine planting three or five of these as a group. I think you'd have a really spectacular show coming from that. It's beautiful from a distance and it's beautiful up close. Love this rose, uh, not only is it bright orange, but it has that golden reverse. Uh, it seems to be a favorite with our customers. On top of that, it has a medium to large bloom, uh, almost four inches in the spring, and a pretty good petal count up to 45 petals. Yeah, so a great rose for all kinds of applications, garden and a rose garden by itself, mass plantings, could be a hedging material. Wonderful, wonderful rose, beautiful to look at. I love the fact that it has an orange reverse. Reverses are always lovely. So take us on the cherry float. Well, cherry float was one of my favorites. So the first time I saw this was in uh, Pomona at a research station there in California, it was, it was climbing. Uh, and the first thing that I thought of was just red blooms just floating on long stems. And that's hard to beat. Yeah, it's it's really lovely. I like, and I like the, the, the red is a clear red. Um, some reds can be kind of muddled. This has got a very nice clear red without being like an in your face kind of red. You know, 10 to 12 foot climber, very mannerly, pick a fence, arbor, things along those lines. You know, good climbers are hard to come by. And I think this is going to be, this is really lovely. Yeah. And one of the things that we look for is blooming on the first year, uh, long arching canes up to 12 uh, feet. Uh, even the stems from the canes are medium to long. So it's great for cutting. And then the bloom size can get, again, almost up to four inches. Well, blooming for a first year on a climber is really unusual because, you know, the thing with climbers is always, you know, sleep, creep, leap. And I always tell people it's the second, even the third year before it comes into play. So the fact that you can get some flowers on this thing right out of the gate is just an added bonus. And there's always reds out there, but uh, this one stood out because it was rated with a very good disease resistance. And also good to come by as well. Yeah, clear color, nice disease resistance, blooms early, manly size, wonderful climber. So that'd be a good one to look out for, folks. Um, so the next one, Over the Edge, talk to me about this one. I love the name, by the way, Over the Edge. How'd that come about? Over the Edge is so uh, feminine in its, in its texture and its color and that light, clear, pink, razor thin edge is where the name came from. When we saw it, we were over the edge for it. Yeah, I can see why. I mean, it's it's almost like it's almost like someone took like a like a, a an icing cone and like piped the edges just a little bit slightly different color to give her that texture. So, and a medium sized bush. And and how's the fragrance on this one? The fragrance is actually strong and fruity. So uh, we always look for fragrance. We always are breeding and looking for breeders with fragrance. So that is a priority here. 
So over the edge, it's got fragrance, it's got disease resistance. I love the piping, that's kind of cool on that rose as well. So I Caramba Cherry Float over the edge. Again, you can get them at jacksonperkins.com. And Wes, I know that you mentioned this to me before we did the pre-production. This is the actually the only place you can get them. Yes, and after years of breeding, years of research, thousands of seedlings, these varieties have only been seen by a handful of people in the world, and they're being available for retail for the first time ever. So this is some of the most unique plant material that you can find for sale anywhere. I mean, that's a nice attraction because, you know, rose lovers always love, we always like to have something kind of unique to us. And that gives us the ability to do it. Plus, like you mentioned, a hundred varieties that are unique to JP that nobody else really carries. So again, jacksonperkins.com. Wes, thank you so much for joining us and always great to talk about roses. Thank you. Same here. Take care. Heidi, it is so nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for having me on today. Really appreciate it. It's our pleasure. And of course, we're all excited about seeing the new roses from Star Roses and Plants. I mean, you know, Star Roses has done so many amazing roses over the years. And of course, all the hybridizers you work with, Will Radler, who did Knockout, Jim Sproul, you know, of course, Mayond. And I know you guys are now working with Cortez. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's the who's who of roses that, uh, <laughs> that Star Roses represents. So yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself, though, first, because I know folks probably don't really know much about you. Yeah, well, my name is Heidi Mortensen. I am the Rose Program Manager and the Bloomables Brand Manager at Star Roses and Plants. So I've been in horticulture for over 20 years, graduated with my degree in horticulture from Utah State University. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything in horticulture. So I've, I've been in retail, wholesale sales, e-commerce. Uh, I was the Executive Director of American Beauty's Native Plants for a while. So um, and now, now I'm here at Star, and I just love it. It's it's amazing the breeders we work with, and um, just all the research and development that's going on in roses is really exciting. And I'm just very honored to be a part of it. Yeah, you guys started us, and like I said at the beginning, some very exciting stuff, and of course, a good long history of roses that you work with. And a question I always like to ask people when I meet them for the first time: You got a great background in horticulture that you just talked us about, which is wonderful. But were you into roses in the beginning? And if not, what was the moment that you went, "Oh, okay, now I'm really getting into roses"? Yeah. So years ago, when I was a retail buyer, um, I visited Star Roses and Plants. Back then, it was only Connor Pyle. Uh, back in the early 2000s, it was right when Knockout was coming out, and I had a chance to uh, see the trial gardens, the commercial comparison beds, and it was just a beautiful day that day. And I remember looking out, and it was my first peek into commercial horticulture, the breeding and development and of roses and uh, plants. And I just knew that someday I wanted to work for Star. Um, I just kind of fell in love that day. So my love of roses has has a long history, so <laughs> I'm I'm excited to be here. So yeah, I mean you're I mean you're with a great company. I know a lot of folks there, and and just they're wonderful people. So now we get to the fun part, Heidi. You get to talk yep. about the roses. We have four new roses mm -hmm. for Star Roses and Plants. Um, first of all, before we dive into the roses, um, where are they widely available from? So our roses are available all across the country at independent garden centers, also big box stores. You can actually visit our website, starrosesandplants.com, and go to where to buy and plug in your zip code and a list of stores that carry our products are available to you. Perfect. So we'll, of course, put the uh, website on the screen so people can see it. So starrosesandplants.com. So Heidi, go ahead. Give us the four. Yeah. So we have four new roses that will be available for 2022. And I'm going to start with probably the big one, and that's the new addition to the Drift family, and that's Blushing Drift. So Blushing Drift is a beautiful uh, soft pink, double petals, and it opens with a warm yellow center. So the Drift family of roses are wonderful genetics out of Mayon, which is in France. And they're actually crosses between miniature roses and ground cover roses. So you actually get the best of both worlds. So with the miniature um, genetics, you get the long lasting repeat blooms from spring to frost and that strong coloration. And from the ground covers, you get the disease resistance, that mounting habit, and the easy maintenance. So um, they are, this variety blushing drift is particularly resistant to powdery mildew. Um, and they have five to 10 blooms per stem. So it's just really proliferous and beautiful. Yeah, I'm growing um, a lot of the 
I've grown a lot of the drift roses and use a lot of them in uh, in landscaping design that I do and stuff. And a little tip for your for folks too with the drift roses, they're actually better planted in mass, like three, four, five, six, seven. That's and plant them tight so they grow into each other. That's when they really start to shine and show off, in my opinion. Yeah, they make a great low hedge. So most of yeah. the drift roses are about one and a half to two feet tall and three feet wide. So they're the perfect little uh, border plant, a low hedge. They also perform really well in containers. Actually, some of my favorite uh, displays of, of drift roses are in containers. In our, uh, in our trial beds in Pennsylvania, we have them in several different types of containers mixed with annuals and perennials, and they perform really well in that situation as well. Yeah, I can believe it too. And the blushing drift, that's a nice, because that's that's a color palette that hasn't really been in the drift family. So that brings in a whole nother le level of color and stuff. So wonderful. Okay. Blushing drift, number one. What's number two? All right. Number two is a new member of the Veranda series. So the Veranda series of roses come from Cordes out of Germany. So the Veranda series are bred specifically to give you that kind of big romantic look, but in a small package. So they're specifically bred for containers. and to do well there. So Fiesta Veranda is our new one. It's the first multicolored rose in the Veranda series. So it's it's yellow, it's largely suffused with oranges, reds, and then it finishes pink. So you get that multi-tone on it all summer long. Um, this rose has performed wonderfully all over the country from Minnesota to California, or Oregon to Florida, and all the way up to Maine. So it has a zone range from five to 11. Yeah, Cordes is a great rose, it's a great genetics. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, as Heidi mentioned, they're out of Germany. And the previous uh, person who ran it, Wilhelm Cordes, who passed away about five, I think five, six years ago, Wilhelm passed away. Um, he was actually one of the very first nurseries in the world, breeders in the world, to stop spraying their test fields. And that goes back about 30, 35 years ago. And that's the reason why Cordes is known as just bulletproof. And the Veranda series is stunning. So wonderful new addition, multicolored. That's going to be exciting on what I know are great genetics. I mean, you, you can never go wrong with a Cordes rose, that's for sure. So yeah. give us number three. All right. Number three is a new addition to the Sunblaze series. So I love Sunblaze roses. It's our, it's our third best-selling series of roses. It's only third to drift and knockout. So these are miniature roses that come out of Mayon out of France. And, um, but they're miniature roses with modern disease resistant. Um, so a lot of times some of the older fashion miniature roses, they defoliate and they wouldn't look that great, but Sunblaze is spectacular genetics. Sunblaze pink is our new one. Um, it's a multi. So it starts dark pink and light pink and white all in one rose. So you get that really pretty multi-tonal display. And it kind of reminds me of like ice cream sundaes or something. <laughs> I like that description. You can plant ice cream sundaes in your garden. I think that'll, that'll right. get people going for Never sure. And, and like you said, being a miniature with disease resistance, I think container, I think front of border, I think a low hedge, a low massing around an entranceway or a mailbox or something like that multiple multiple uses and disease resistance in miniature roses that's a wonderful thing is you are as you mentioned that hasn't really been very widely found yeah exactly and the color selection of the sunblaze series just can't be beat we have over 14 colors we have two more coming in 23 and many more for 24 so uh keep an eye on sunblaze because it's fast growing um great genetics and honestly i think it's a great replacement for annuals so Perfect. Yeah, you just and thank you for by the way for teasing the uh, the new rose episodes I'm going to do for 2023 and 2024. You just teased them both. That's right. <laughs> we'll get to see the new sun blaze in that. And we got yeah. one more. What's the last one? Oh, I saved the best for last. So uh, ruby red. So ruby red. If if you love the color and the look of Mr. Lincoln or Olympiad, which is kind of those old fashioned red hybrid teas, ruby red is is that beautiful non fading fire engine red in a grand of flora package, but it's more compact and extremely disease resistant. So Ruby Red comes out of Mayon again, wonderful breeders. Um, this, this rose is a zone party to zone five to 10. It's on its own root stock. So you never have to worry about being budded and it dying back, coming back a different color. Um, this rose looks amazing in containers and really stands out in the garden. But that fire engine red has really dark, green, glossy foliage, so it really stands out. That sounds beautiful. I mean, that's those, like you said, Mr. Lincoln and Olympiad, you named two classic reds. And um, 
the fact that it's on its own roots speaks well to its vigor and health as a natural vigor and health as a bush. Because I'm a big fan of own root roses. And I, yeah. what a great new red. I mean, that sounds like a wonderful addition. Yeah, it's a beautiful. It stands out in our trial gardens. You can see it from across the way. So um, I hope I hope you give it a shot. Uh, I think you'll be I think you'll be very pleased. Well, fire orange and red, I think that's got to show up from pretty much probably from space. I might say. <laughs> <laughs> it might. <laughs> yeah, Just might. That, right. So, well, Heidi, thank you so much for joining us and, and telling us about the new roses. Again, they're widely available in independent garden centers and box stores. Go to starrosesandplants.com. And Heidi, thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me again on the Everyday Rose Show. Oh, Paul, it's wonderful to be back, and it's always great to be here with you. Yeah, and for those of you viewers who didn't see it, uh, Rebecca and I did a, uh, an episode earlier this year called All Things David Austin, and I'll put the link up on the screen. That's a much more in-depth conversation about David Austin roses, but here today, we're focusing on the new roses. And I think one of the things I think we should talk about right up front is that your roses are available in two kinds of places. One is independent garden centers and right. also on your website, but not necessarily in both places at once. So talk about that with the new ones and also some of the old favorites. Yeah. So, you know, David Austin is a boutique brand. We don't grow the quantity that a lot of the other Rose brands do. Um, we're in 35 countries around the world, so we have to kind of share the love. We always introduce new varieties at davidaustinroses.com and go to the U.S. site. When you log in, you'll see there's UK, Japan, you know, U.S. So go into the U.S. portal. Uh, for that. But um, why we do that is it takes a while to get the quantity ramped up for the entire United States. And even once they make it to wholesale, and when we say wholesale, that's meaning the independent garden centers in year two, we're still in the process of ramping up quantities because the U.S. is a big place. Yeah, it is. It's a large country. And that's a great way, like you said, to sort of get them out there so the public can get a hold of them uh, mm -hmm. before they hit the garden centers. And, and I would advise people actually subscribe to the David Austin Roses newsletter um, is really the best thing to do. And that's where you'll get notices of when these new roses are coming because they can go very, very fast. I've, I've noticed over the oh, years. Oh, yes, they can. Oh, yeah, yes. They, they can. David Austin has a loyal fan that will hunt those things down. And, and like Rebecca said, don't go to the UK website because you're just going to look at a bunch of stuff you can't get yet. Uh, so, <laughs> I know it's fun to look. It is so. fun to look. I do it all the time. <laughs> I can't. I can't resist myself. So, well, great. And then also on on the website too are some of the roses that are no some of your older varieties, some of the old favorites that are also no longer in in garden centers, and folks can find those there as well. Correct. Yeah, exactly. You have to realize that the U.S. is so diverse. And what we try to offer in garden centers are roses that are going to be the best performers for the United States. I talk about Lady of Shalott so much, but she does well from coast to coast. You know, I just came back from an, one of our East Coast trials and one of our older roses the crocus rose blew me away. It was doing fantastic. That's a rose we see doing really well from coast to coast too, but it kind of flies under the radar. So um, what we do is we focus on the top performers for the independent garden centers because we want our growers to be successful. But if you're really jonesing for something that you know you can't get, always go back to the website. Yeah, so that's two great places, great advice, two great places to get the roses. Garden Center's website, you can kind of work, work with both of them really nicely. So now we get the fun stuff, we get to talk about the new roses. So I'm going to turn this over to you and let you roll. you got uh, two new ones in the United States. So these two are only available on the website this year. These only are the new ones you're rolling out. So take it away. Take it away. Our very first is Silas Marner. And having just come from this trial um, on the East Coast, I was so impressed by it. This trial was in late September. A lot of our older varieties, and this is candid conversation that we're sharing with our closest friends, wonderful roses, but they were starting to shut down. Silas Marner was loaded with blooms. It's kind of a mid-size arching shrub. Uh, it has abundant pink flowers. And when I say abundant pink flowers, 
it was loaded, Paul, it was totally loaded. And the flowers are a pale pink with kind of a, a lighter res reverse on the underneath and the outside edge edges uh, fade to a lighter color. You often hear us refer to that as an halo effect, and that was a characteristic that Mr. Austin actively bred for. It has a button eye, something that he thought was very charming, and it also has a wonderful old rose fragrance that has hints of lemon, green banana, which is a fragrance profile I've not seen pop up yet, and apricot. Now, um, when I was in high school, I remember reading uh, Silas Marner. You probably had to read it too. And it was one of George Eliot's classic novels. There is, if you're really into literature, British literature, um, a lot of these roses we talk about today are gonna be things you want to add to your garden. We have a whole British literature series. Yeah, I know the literary. I know Mr. Austin did a lot of you know characters in, in books and British literature and British books and things like that. And that's one of the things that kind of makes him charming. You know, you you read the book, you read the story, and you know, and and then all of a sudden, oh, here's a rose that 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 takes a look at it. And I'm looking at the photograph of this rose, as are the folks on the screen. And I do like that that what you what Mr. Austin called the halo effect, that lighter petal, because when you get a rose like this, it's got abundance of bloom. It's not just one color across the board. You've got different colors and variations of color moving across the bush. Exactly. It picks up the light and it glows. That's why photographers love having roses that have that characteristic. It really makes their work look wonderful. So the second rose that we are introducing at davidaustinroses.com will be the country parson. And the British or the, the mothership is describing this as a true yellow. But I'm going to be honest with you, it's a stunning rose, again, loaded with flowers late in September. It's going to be a little bit lighter uh, yellow here in the States because we do have higher light. Nonetheless, really, really pretty and worthy of putting in your garden. Um, it's a feisty rose of Scottish descent. So perhaps I need to add this to my own garden. I like the word feisty there. Um, medium to large yellow flowers that have kind of a, a flat appearance. And if you're keeping up with our breeding program, you'll notice that some of our newer varieties are, are getting kind of these flatter flowers. They're very uh, uh, sauce, uh, almost kind of saucer shape, but very showy. They're holding up well in rain and, and wind, which is really important in the US. Um, it does have a very strong fruity fragrance, um, notes of apricot, green apple, and honey. So I really like that. Now, this is kind of a rounded form. It does have a lot of little spiny thorns, which kind of hints at the breeding. Can't give too much away there, but nice, uh, gray green leaves and leaves on a rose can be just as important as the flowers when you're working with the design. So I think that's gonna be really nice. Um, you know what, I, I love this rose and uh, it almost has those outer petals again, have kind of a translucent appearance to them and it's just gonna glow in the garden light. Very, very good. Yeah, it's a beautiful color. It's that 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 Austin yellow that I like. It's I mean, I love yellow. I love yellow rose. I love yellow in the garden. You know, I've had conversations about this, but that Austin yellow mm -hmm. is a while it's a yellow that you can spot and see. It's it's not a garish yellow. No, it's very soft and it plays yeah. well with others. You know, um, yellows are hard to breed for. And um, when we were going through the trials, one of the things that we noticed is the Austin yellow roses really look fantastic and are quite disease resistant. And uh, that's tricky because a lot of this new stuff is fragrant and disease resistant, which is doubly tricky. <laughs> so. yeah, that's the holy grail though, that fragrance yeah. and disease resistance. And it was hard to get the two together for a while. Yeah, and uh, you know, Mr. Austin is doing it. And there's other breeders as well to give credit, but it's nice that we're seeing the fragrance come back in because you know, you know I've always talked about the first thing everybody wants to do with a rose is smell it. Yeah. yeah. So now we're going to transition into what you're seeing at the independent garden centers this year. 
this may be one of the most requested varieties I've had where people are going, Gabriel Oak, can I get it at the garden center? This year, you should be able to. And the cool thing about Gabriel Oak is it has this amazingly bright, bright pink flower. It's got a five fragrance rating that is fruity. It's a nice, healthy plant. Um, and it's got like these dark berry laced with current notes and they say a mulberry stem on it. Now with COVID, I hate to say, I've seen less of these in person than I would have in a normal year, but I did get to see it at the trials. I give it my thumbs up. It's a good plant and um, I think it's gonna do quite well for folks. It seems to be very vigorous. Yeah, I see some chatter on uh, on Facebook in the groups, in my group as well, on, on people who, who got a hold of this last year or people in the UK who had it for a little bit longer. And it's getting quite quite a bit of raves and sensations. And yeah. like you said, the color is striking. It's, it's, it's a very bright, but again, not garish. And I keep using that word with Austin, but that's that's what I keep coming back to. Right, right. It, uh, it's a rich, deep pink. Some It's got a little bit of a magenta to it, but... Um, it's quite nice. And just FYI, Gabriel Oak uh, was a beloved ca character in Thomas Hardy's novel, Far From the Maddening Crowd. So there goes the literary references. There the literary. You'll see them threading yeah, through exactly. yes, on a constant basis. So lovely, Rose. Who else do we have? So while we're talking about uh, Thomas Hardy, let's go on and talk about Eustacia Vi. And she was another Thomas Hardy uh, character who was absolutely stunning, but kind of a flawed heroine. I don't think this rose is flawed. I'm, I'm very impressed with what I'm seeing. I think this is a great rose for a container. Again, a very nice, strong, fruity fragrance. Um, this one has kind of a glowing apricot pink flower. Um, and I just, and it's, it's really, really nice. I think it's gonna be a little bit better for cooler uh, areas of the country, Paul. Um, I think Gabriel Oak maybe will handle the heat a little bit better, but if you are in the Northeast or the Midwest, um, I think I would go with Eustacia Bai. Now, horticulture keeps us humble. We may have this out for a few more <laughs> years and I may change my tune, but that's what I'm thinking right now. Yeah, but that's great, honest advice, and that's 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 what's nice for the that's what the customers want. They want to say, okay, you know, maybe I'll try this in a warm climate. But Rebecca has told me that it might not do as well. So that's yeah. that's that's the important stuff to talk about, though. And if you're in a hot, humid climate and you're having huge success with Eustacia Bay, call me and let me know because I <laughs> love that information. <laughs> All, operators are standing by. <laughs> operators are standing by. So here's another one. Uh, Tottering by Gently is being Love, offered. love, 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 love. You know how much I love this baby. I know. This is a single. So for all you folks that think Mr. Austin only bred high petal count roses, not true. This is a lovely single. You remember Kew Gardens, which is wildly popular over across the pond. Um, this is kind of our version of it. A nice soft yellow, lots of stamens, brings in pollinators. Those exposed stamens also always hints that it could be a musk fragrance. And this is, it's a very nice musk fragrance. Um, the thing that I like about this, this has a little bit of a a modern edge to it. So I think it's going to blend incredibly well with ornamental grasses, a little bit smaller ornamental grasses. And you, if you're a lover of perennials, I think this is something that's going to tuck nicely into the border for you. Yeah, this is a real landscape type shrub. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have one in my garden. I got one last year and put it in. I saw it for the first time now two and a half, two years ago um, at the Austin Nursery in England. That's when I first got introduced to it. And, and just I remember walking by and going, oh my gosh, that's, I love this thing. And, and it's beautiful. And your point about the single petals having open stamens for pollinators is important 
because a lot of the very fully petaled roses, they, they can't get to the stamen. So that actually doesn't work well for pollinators. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I've seen bees going, I'm trying to get in there, but I, <laughs> it's too dense. It's too dense. I'm so. not going to, nobody's opening the door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you yeah. Well, but this is a great one for that. So this is a lovely, lovely rose. And I think you've got a couple more you'd like to chat about too. Two more. And these have already been introduced, but I want to mention them. I think they're worthy again with uh, kind of the pandemic nothing was normal so I don't think these really kind of got uh, the the recognition that they should have this is an author and not a character in a, a novel this is Emily Bronte and um, she is not going to disappoint she has very distinctive neat flat flat blooms again with a lovely soft pink flower um, and a rich apricot center. The flowers or the petals rather get a little smaller towards the center of the flower and the stamens are buried a lot deeper. We just talked about these nice uh, stamens on tottering by gently. Well, these are buried a little deeper in the flower. And I think that adds a whole nother uh, characteristic to it. This has a very, very nice strong tea fragrance that is become going to become more old rose scented with age. So, you know, I kind of like you're getting a two for one here, a, a complex uh, fragrance on that. Yeah, it's um, a pretty rose, beautiful color. And like you said, the fragrance is nice. And, and I know you've got one more and I'm going to vouch for this one personally. I've got five of them in my garden and um, Vanessa Bell, which is just an outstanding uh, uh, rose. Let me tell you what, um, I think she was the queen of the trials. Uh, I was so impressed with what I saw across the board. I will tell you this, our newer varieties, you're getting a better remonency, you know, more flowers. Um, the fragrance is there, the disease resistance was there. We do a spray and non-spray trial so that we can compare and contrast. Vanessa Bell was loaded. You would have thought that it was April or May and not the end of September. The fragrance, wow, it was amazing. But Paul, here's the thing. A lot of American shoppers bypass her because they see that pale yellow um, uh, 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 flower. And here is a fault that Americans make. They go for, um, big, let's have the biggest flower we possibly can, where sometimes um, having a smaller flower that has a lot is just as good. Let's go back to the, this literary thread. Mr. Alston knew that not everyone can be the head of the show. You know, they can't be the lead character. Sometimes you need some really strong supporting characters and Vanessa Bell could do that. Um, you can blend her with whites, creams, deeper yellows, pinks, and she's going to look lovely. Pair with something lavender, um, and you're going to look like a rock star. So. Yeah, and it's the rose. It, it's, you know, even though the bloom may be a little bit smaller or whatever, if you're doing these and using these the way that Mr. Austin envisioned, which is with perennials and other plants in a general mm -hmm. garden setting, the bloom size is really kind of irrelevant. Um, you it know, is. because that's, it it, that's also going to give you the, you know, a big flower and a small flower. Now you're getting some mm -hmm. contrast going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, this rose for me, I'm, a, I'm in upstate South Carolina, as most people know, I'm a zone seven. I do not spray at all. Um, mm -hmm. This rose doesn't lose foliage. It, it's one of the first to bloom, one of the last to bloom. Um, you know, so if folks are passing it by, you know, you're welcome to pick one up and send another one to me because, uh, be... <laughs> <laughs> but don't pass this by. If you see Vanessa Bell, grab it. You won't be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah, She's fantastic. Go. She, yeah, is. she is. And, um, you know, I'll have to admit when I first saw the photo, I was kind of like, mm. once I smelt her is a, a lovely kind of a green tea scent with some undertones of honey 
in there. It's just, you're going to be a winner. You yeah. will be successful with her. Definitely. Absolutely. It's a great row. So Rebecca, thank you as always. It's great to talk hey, to you. Thank you, you know, Paul. I know we'll do another episode down the road where we'll stress this into a longer thing, but it was great to meet the new roses. David Austin Roses.com, folks, the United States site for the U.S. growers. That's the place to go. And Rebecca, thanks again for joining me on the Everyday Row Show. Hey, thank you.